Hello, good afternoon everyone and welcome to another Art for All group. My name is Lucy and this group would normally run in the Anniversary Centre when, uh, when we are allowed to be in the hospice but until we're allowed to return to our normal groups this group will run online every Tuesday afternoon on YouTube. And this week, I wanted to think a little bit about Valentine's Day that's coming up. So ways of marking the time is passing, even though we are still in lockdown at the moment. And I wanted to think not just about romantic love that we normally associate with Valentine's Day, but also the history of Valentine's Day and also different types of love that maybe are even more important than ever um, in, in a world that's very different from the Valentine's Day we celebrated last year. So first of all, first up we have, yes, a little sign saying, I heart art. And maybe that's what I'm feeling at the moment. And next, thinking about the history of Valentine's Day. So why do we celebrate Valentine's Day? Where does it come from? Um, so like many modern holidays, it's got its roots in a pagan festival. And uh, there was a festival in ancient Rome called Lupercalia which lasted from February 13th to February 15th. And apparently men sacrificed goats and dogs and then beat women with the freshly killed animals hides because they thought it was a fertility rite. So um, I'm quite happy that uh, we've, uh, we've changed things to uh, be receiving flowers and uh, slightly overpriced chocolates. I think, uh, I think that's a, a gift I'd rather, I'd rather get on Valentine's Day. Um, and when thinking about who St. Valentine actually was, there's a bit of confusion because the Emperor Claudius executed two men named Valentine during his reign. They were both born on the 14th of February and they're actually both now saints. So we're not actually sure which was the St. Valentine which gave their name to the day. Um, and in medieval times, people believed that birds came out to choose their mates on February 14th. So they might not be doing much of that this year because it is quite snowy. They might still be huddled up trying to keep warm. Um, but actually, um, because of this, we have one of the earliest um, surviving references to Valentine's Day um, from 1382, which was in Geoffrey Chaucer, who wrote the Canterbury Tales. He wrote another book called The Parliament of Fowls. And he said, for this was on St. Valentine's Day, when every fowl cometh there to chess his mate, to choose his mate. So Valentine's Day was celebrated all the way back in the 14th century. And Henry VIII in the 16th century made it a national holiday. Obviously he had six wives, so clearly um, Valentine's Day spoke to him in some way. And it was a national holiday in 1537. And in Elizabethan England, um, people had a superstition about Valentine's Day that the first two single people who met in the morning on St. Valentine's Day were likely to get married. So be careful who you run into um, on Sunday morning. Um, and also St. Valentine isn't just the patron saint of people in love. He also is the patron saint of epileptics, plague victims and beekeepers. So he's a quite a busy man. So I thought about all of this, all the history of Valentine's Day, and it all seemed centered around romantic love or birds finding mates, but I thought maybe it's a good idea to look back uh, to ancient Greece and around the world and think about different kinds of love, because romantic love is one thing, but actually there's so much more love in the world than just romantic love. And maybe it's good to celebrate more than just giving a card on Valentine's Day. Maybe there's something more we could be celebrating. So this I thought was quite a nice representation of different kinds of love. And we have Eros, which we might recognize as kind of erotic or romantic love that's normally celebrated on Valentine's Day. Storge was another ancient Greek term for the love of family, parental love or love, um, love for one's parents, love of a child. Uh, pragma is love that kind of stands the test of time and it's where we get the word pragmatism from. So it's kind of adapting to, I know the, the changes that happens in, in our lives and um, changes in love as well. We don't stay in uh, romantic, erotic love necessarily all of our lives, um, but we sort of develop stronger feelings that evolve out of romantic love. We also have ludos, ludus, uh, which is to do with kind of playful love and kind of where you might tease someone that you love and it can coexist with all these other kinds of love. Agape 
is uh, is kind of the love of humanity or compassion for the world or the love of God. So a really big, wide reaching, far reaching love. We also have not listed on here philia, which is kind of friendship. And uh, so we also have um, philia gives the word for um, respect for or love for and many different things. So we have philosophy, that means a love of wisdom, uh, philharmonia, love of harmony, um, uh, lots of other philias that I can't quite think of yet, but there's kind of this respectful friendship and a getting to know and the idea that a friendship can make one a better person and that that is a form of love. So really kind of um, an interesting concept of growth. And lastly, philatia, which is the love that one has for oneself that can be both positive and a negative. And I think for all of these loves, there can be positives and negatives um, within them. And it's important to keep the balance within them. So, and then I thought, how can I find art examples of um, these um, kinds of love? And can I find um, maybe activities that can go along that you could try at home to go along with these? So. Here we go. And I thought of, if anybody's been to the South Bank Centre back in 2014, they had a display about all these different kinds of love. And you have, you can see agape there, and you can see storge, which is to do with family. So they had slides that children could go down. And this kind of playfulness and really thinking about all these dimensions of love and ways to kind of walk around and enjoy it really. And I think that's what we're, maybe what I'm missing at the moment, what we're all missing at the moment, being able to get out and enjoy and celebrate. So maybe these are things we have to find different ways to do at home. And I thought that first of all, I'd go straight in there, go for Eros. And I thought, when I think of Eros, who do I think of? What do I think of? And I thought, of course, it has to be the statue of Eros at Piccadilly Circus. It might have been a while since a lot of us have seen him. And actually, Eros in Piccadilly Circus has a secret because the statue is not actually of Eros at all. It's actually of another god, Antiros. So Eros and Antiros. Eros is the one who causes love to happen. He fires the arrow. But Antiros is the god of love returned. So requited love. And this was a reference to the Earl of Shaftesbury. Obviously Shaftesbury Avenue runs up from Piccadilly Circus. He was a social reformer and he campaigned for child labour reforms and improved conditions in factories, schools and hospitals. And so actually... Antiros means that love is happening, love exists, love is this erotic love isn't just a possibility or the arrow flying through the air, it's hit its mark and the person is loving other people in return. So actually, I think that's quite a nice dimension to Eros. It makes, makes this statue kind of mean more in a way. It's not just, I don't know, the stereotypical, maybe sort of pastiche of Valentine's or romantic love, it's actually it means a bit more, goes a bit deeper. So that's, I, I quite liked learning that about Eros in Piccadilly Circus. And next I thought of Storge. And when I thought of Storge, the love of family and the love of parents and children, and there's something about duty here and about maybe not the most glamorous love, but I thought of the work of the Impressionist Mary Cassatt. And I thought of the idea that Cassatt made visible both the physical and psychological work involved in caring for a child, as well as the artistic work that underpinned her paintings, forms, coloration and surface. And she was one of the founding members of the Impressionist. She was an American artist and she drew, or she painted so, uh, for the bulk of her career, scenes of domestic life for middle-class women, bathing children, playing with children, sitting with children, not in the form of religious iconography, though obviously it took from that, but kind of these quiet moments and these uh, these lives that hadn't really been documented before and really showing, I know, the bare bones, what it is that makes up love for most of us. And perhaps this is the most important love of all. This is the love that kind of sets the benchmark for everything else in our lives. This is where it all starts. Um, and next I thought of um, Philia. This is um, from Raphael's painting in the Vatican City called the School of Athens. And this is Aristotle talking to Plato. I don't think they ever met in life. Um, I imagine they lived actually probably hundreds of years apart, but um, the idea that they would have got on, that they would have um, had interesting discussions that would have advanced them both as thinkers. 
And I think what really went with this was um, the, the phrase from the Greek philosopher Epictetus, mm. the key is to keep company only with people who uplift you, whose presence calls forth your best. And I think that's maybe a great lesson to take into life, that kind of to keep company with friends you love, whose presence calls forth your, your best. And there's uh, the poet Hilier Belloc put it, um, from quiet homes and first beginnings out to the undiscovered ends, there's nothing worth the wear of winning but laughter and the love of friends. And maybe during lockdown, it's our family and our friends very often who have got us through dark times and we've maybe found deeper connections during this time. I don't know, something to think about. Next, I thought of Agape. And um, when I was finding art to do with this, the th first thing that came up was um, something that still happens in some Christian communities around the world, but an agape feast or a love feast is a communal meal shared among Christians. And the image that I found is a fresco of a banquet at a tomb in the catacomb of St. Marcellinus and Peter underneath um, the Via Labicana in Rome. So this was painted on the wall of a catacomb. So people would have congregated in the catacombs, early Christians, and depicted their lives here, but also like the Last Supper, shared communal meals, shared food together, and share in the sharing of food and the sharing of stories. There's also the sharing of love. And this is maybe the idea of kind of not keeping things just to ourselves, to be compassionate towards humanity. Maybe it comes down to sharing vaccines out um, between different countries, not just rich countries getting vaccines, maybe it comes down to giving aid, maybe it, thinking about being compassionate and open and loving humankind and also a love of God, if you believe in God. I then thought of uh, Ludus and um, I thought of this picture by Peter Bruegel, um, the elder, and uh, this is a children's game. There are over 80 different types of games shown here. And uh, some of them look a little bit, <laughs> a little bit uh, energetic. Um, but Bruegel shows the children absorbed in their games with all the seriousness of display by adults. And his moral is that in the mind of God, children's games possess as much significance to the activities of their parents. So maybe this is a reminder to all of us that actually play and playing and playfulness in love can be as important to connections with people as the very, very serious conversations. So maybe there's a place for both, I think. And then I went on to pragma and pragma is um, lasting love. It's where we get the word pragmatism from. And the psychoanalyst Eric Fromm said that we expend too much energy on falling in love and need to learn more how to stand in love. And pragma is about standing in love, making an effort to give love rather than just receive it. And Stephanie Klein said, what we wait for a lifetime with, with one person, we can find in a moment with someone else. So pragma stands for that, this kind of really something that's built and something that is solid. And I thought of the Taj Mahal. The Taj Mahal is actually a tomb. It was built by Shah Jahan for his wife, Mumtaz Mahal. And it was meant to be this everlasting monument to her and it has been it's um and it's famous around the world as a beautiful symbol of perfection he wanted to build a mirror a mirror image on the other side of the river that would be his tomb his would have been in black marble but it was never built so we just have this as a testament to his wife so maybe that is pragma in action and finally have philautia and this is um uh, the painting here is, uh, you might guess it's by Salvador Dali, and it's the metamorphosis of Narcissus and um, Philautio's self-love. And I think we can think of it as, in its negative capacity as narcissistic. So Narcissus was a human in Greek legend who became enamoured with his own reflection in a pool and wasted away because um, he spent so much time looking at himself. Um, but we can also think about how self-love can be really important and have positive connotations. So pride parades, self-respect movements, self-love protests, the hippie era, new age feminist movement, as well as the increase in mental health awareness that promotes self-love as intrinsic to self-help. 
and thinking about support groups working to prevent substance abuse and suicide and I think in lockdown in a long time not being able to be around other people often we have to be able to be kind to ourselves and to provide ourselves with love and to say actually it's okay to to love ourselves we're not going to turn into narcissus we can hold all these different types of love agape love for other people love for our families love for our friends and if we have all of those then self-love as well is really important and uh, actually vital to allow all the others to exist so i think thinking that they all exist in harmony so as our activities you might want to maybe focus on storge you might want to draw your family tree or you might want to capture a moment in your family life whether that's in photograph whether that's possibly a drawing maybe you might want to focus on a memory with your family um or you might want to focus on eros or anti-eros requited love and um, you want to go down the idea of romance and think about maybe a piece of music that captures romance for you or you might want to celebrate your friends and think about what it is about friendship that matters most to you, maybe capturing the shapes and colours that come to you when you think of friendship. Or you might want to focus on maybe something about love for the world, love of nature, and think about things that spark joy in you from the greater world around you and capture those in some way in art. Or perhaps you might want to try drawing a self-portrait, a compassionate self-portrait as an example of philautia. And also maybe as an example of philautia, looking at whatever art you make. And I think we're often very, very quick to judge our own artwork and to say, oh, it's no good. There's nothing good about it. But actually maybe to when you make a piece of art, if you make a piece of art or writing, or whatever you do in your day to kind of say okay so there are some things that I would change but actually finding one or two good things to say about it and allowing yourself to focus on those and that can be very very powerful and very important and maybe perhaps the most important gift to give yourself on Valentine's Day so I hope that you have a restful week and an enjoyable weekend on Valentine's Day, um, however you choose to spend it. And I will look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you for joining. Goodbye.